Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello, health junkies. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause, and today we're going to talk about hormone imbalances and how addressing these balances right now is vital to reducing your risk of cancer and and autoimmune conditions and things of that nature in the future. But also, it's just a great idea to look at these hormone imbalances and really try to get rid of that monthly or daily misery that you are dealing with. So, so what am I talking about here when I say hormone imbalance? I'm talking about mostly estrogen dominance, but I'm also talking about your ability to manage stress, so elevated cortisol levels. I'm also talking about reduced amounts of progesterone because estrogen and progesterone in, in the lady's body, we, we work very well to address the balance of these and, and our body sometimes just can't do that because if we're stressed, our body steals the precursors that we use to make progesterone. And if we don't have sufficient amounts of progesterone, we have all kinds of symptoms. And so take a look at the last month. Do you have PMS? Do you turn in a monster a week before your period? Do your family members joke that you need to be locked away a week or so before your period? Have you contemplated divorce every single month um, from your partner because you just get so irritated that week or so before your period? Or what about migraines? Do you get a migraine mid-cycle or right before your period or the day of? Or do you struggle with with breast tenderness that's extremely painful? Do you have insomnia the week before the period? You know, these types of things are really, really critical signs to pay attention to. A lot of us just say, oh, I have PMS, no big deal. And and it's kind of blown off as, as that it's a normal thing. It's not normal to be extremely irritable every single week before your period. That's not normal. It's not normal to gain five or so pounds before your period and have extreme bloating. That's not normal. It's not normal for you to feel sluggish or foggy before a period. I know a lot of times in society we just say, oh, PMS, no big deal. But these signs are critical signs because what they're telling you is that your estrogen levels are extremely high. Now, Take that in consideration along with your body type. Do you tend to gain weight in the thighs? Do you have what I call a bra muffin top? By that I mean your bra goes on and then you've got this tissue hanging over that bra. That's a sign of estrogen dominance. Do you have bingo arms? When I say bingo arms, I mean do you have tissue that hangs down when you wave your arm below that tricep? Do you have a little flab going on? Those are signs of of estrogen dominance. What about sex drive? Is your sex drive completely in the tank? Another big thing here. And so what I'm trying to get across to a lot of of ladies out there, and guys too, because unfortunately we're starting to see a lot of guys that are getting more estrogen into their body than they need to, and almost cycling much like a female. So ladies out there, if you have a male in your life, or guys, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, hmm, I know my lady has some hormone imbalance, don't judge so quickly, you might too. And, And think of it this way. Do you notice that cyclically you just kind of feel depressed or there's a ser- like a part of the time of the month where you just are like, oh, man, I don't feel so good. And, and you just chalk it up to maybe you've been w- working a lot at, you know, your job or you've been, you know, burning the candle at both ends with a couple projects. Guys, you guys, too, can also have some issues here. And, and same goes with the weight gain around the thighs, um, low abdomen, hips, and also that uh, upper back fluff. So something to keep in mind because estrogen dominance can also happen in males in particular. And also there's the joke of the man boobs. But yes, if you're noticing that your man boobs are getting a little bigger, that's an estrogen issue. And and why I wanted to talk about this is estrogen dominance is linked to allergies. It's linked to autoimmune disorders. It's linked to breast cancer. And guys can get breast cancer too. So keep that in mind. It's, it's uterine cancer as well, infertility, ovarian cysts, increased clotting. So this is a 
lot of um, things here, a lot of issues. In particular, the biggest one is the breast and uterine cancer risk because there are so many cancers out there that are estrogen positive. And by that, I mean estrogen feeds them. The more estrogen you have in the body, the more these little tumors are hanging out, the more you're going to feed them. And that is not a good thing. You don't want to be messing with that. And so, ladies, if you're noticing that you gain weight around the thighs, and guys too, um, if you're noticing that you're gaining weight around the thighs, the low abdomen, and ladies, if you do have that bra fluff, or guys, if you ha- are noticing that the man boobs are starting to get larger, this is this is a big deal and something to pay attention to because of the implications further on later on in life. Now, one of the big things that I really want to talk about as well is that we've got this society that's all about low carb and paleo, and you can pretty much find any sweet treats out there in the universe now that are made of almond flour or some type of nut flour. And so we're turning a lot over from going from our whole grains and our flour-based types of treats and foods to a lot of nuts and nut flours. Well, nuts are high in copper. Copper promotes estrogen dominance. I have seen in a lot of my patients who have gone paleo or have gone really low carb or even keto in some cases who are eating a little low level of nuts or never ate nuts before and now they're eating high levels of treats and sweets with nuts, we're starting to get more issues with weight and hormonal changes. And and this is a big issue because it's it's almost that now we we're promoting more estrogen dominance through thinking that we're eating healthier. And that combined with eating out of Teflon pans and drinking hot coffee out of plastic lids, those black lids that are on your your coffee cups, these are sources of heated up estrogen. So plant, it's not plant, excuse me, it is xenoestrogens. These are plastic estrogens. And so storing all of our hot foods in plastics, these are problems. Anywhere that you have heated up plastic getting into your life, like saran wraps, things of that nature, these can all help in contributing to estrogen dominance. The other big thing is your canned goods. And if you have goods that have BPA or any of the other chemicals on the lining, guess what? You're getting interruption of your ability to deal with estrogen processing. And then you combine that along with stress and stress in your life. And guess what? We we take cortisol. So cortisol is our stress hormone, but it's also our hormone to help us to go to sleep and wake up. But our bodies will take the precursors to progesterone and push making cortisol versus progesterone. And so pretty much most of the U.S. population who is stressed out is unfortunately making, we're we're unfortunately making a lot more cortisol than we are progesterone. Nine times out of 10, when I'm looking at a female who has infertility, she's fatigued, she's losing hair, and she keeps gaining weight. And of course, on top of that, she's got tender breasts before a period, she's got migraines, etc. If I can give her a little bit of progesterone, we can turn things around. And a lot of times we can help with fertility. We can also help to get those darn hormones in check and bring that estrogen level down. So a lot of people are afraid of estrogen and progesterone replacement. And absolutely you should be. There are risks in in hormone replacement therapy. However, a lot of times if you're, if you're looking into this, you're thinking about the synthetic hormones. These are the ones that are made in a lab. They do not look or act the same as our regular hormones. Now, bioidentical hormones are also made in a lab, but they look and act very similar to the hormones that our body uses. And so they're more effective, more bioavailable is the technical term. And these ones are the ones that come from a compounding pharmacy. They're not from your regular pharmacy out there. And these types of hormones can be quite beneficial in helping you to regulate your hormones. Now, of course, I'm a naturopathic doctor and I'm always going to say what is the least type of intervention that I can do to help with balancing hormones. 
Of course, there's all of getting the the hormone disruptors out of your body. And I do have a previous podcast on how to get that out of your body. I, I talk about getting your spatula, throwing out your spatulas and, and taking care of what you're cooking with. And so listen to that podcast to get those those down. But Or you can Google search estrogen um, dominance and hormone disruptors, and you'll get a ton of information there. In particular, Christiane Northrup is a great resource. She's a medical doctor that's been working with female hormone imbalances for years. I have learned a lot from this lady and absolutely one great resource and I have her linked at the end of my podcast notes here so definitely check that out so because I'm not going to go into all of the estrogen and hormone disruption stuff I'm going to jump back to the the hormone replacement I have a lot of females who do really well with progesterone creams and you have to go through either a naturopathic doctor or a medical doctor to get a compounded cream and what I often have people do before you even consider, you know, just jumping on that route, you, you want to see where your hormones are first. And so there's really great ways to look at where are your hormones. And you want to do this in the second half of your cycle. And you want to consider doing either a blood test or a saliva test. And I'll talk about the reasons why. So from day 19 to 26, of your period, this is when you want to have an assessment done. So either you're going to go, you know, you will have got a a lab sheet from your doctor and you're going to get your hormones drawn to look at your progesterone, your total estrogens. You'll look at estradiol because that is your active estrogen. And if you get the total estrogens, estrogens, that'll give you a great idea of what's going on completely in terms of your estrogens. Now, also, I do recommend folks to still get testosterone checked because I think it's it's part of the picture and we do want to know what's going on. And then you also want to get DHEAS checked. DHEA is your precursor to testosterone and estrogen. And if this level is low, it's often going to be because you are stressed out. And if we don't have the precursors to make testosterone and estrogen, but our estrogen levels are high... Now you're thinking a lot of environmental estrogen or you're thinking fat storage estrogen because the more fatty tissue that you have, the more ability to store estrogen you have. So that's why weight is directly related to cancers and things of that nature. It's because in our fat, we store hormones. Now, progesterone, on the other hand, this hormone, like I mentioned before, gets stolen, basically. It's called progesterone steel in the medical community. And what happens is our body does not make sufficient amounts when we're making lots of cortisol because we're stressed out. And symptoms that your progesterone might be low is insomnia, sleep disturbances, so difficulty falling asleep, waking up early in the morning, irritability and anger absolutely go along with progesterone and weight gain. If you are lacking progesterone, you will have insomnia, irritability, or weight gain and some type of of component there. If you are lacking testosterone, you might have issues with weight gain as well, and you might have issues with libido, so your sex drive. The higher the estrogen dominance is, the less sex drive someone has, and so something to keep in mind there. Now, estradiol and estriol, these are our estrogens, and in particular, we have three estrogens. There's estradiol, which is known as E2, estriol, which is known as E3, and something called estrone, which is known as E1. Estrone is your inflammatory estrogen. It's directly related to all of the crazy PMS symptoms. That's where it's coming from. Estradiol is helpful. We do need some estrogen. Don't think that all estrogen's bad. We do need some. Estradiol is great for helping your digestive system lining remain intact so it prevents leaky gut. It also helps with keeping your bone nice and strong. And so that is where estrogen replacement therapy comes in is if someone has weak bones, osteoporosis, or osteopenia, it can be extremely helpful here. But if you are estrogen dominant and then you get put on hormone replacement therapy with estrogens in it, this can compound your situation. That's where we get issues with cancer. Now, hot flashes. This is another thing estradiol helps with. Wrinkles, fine lines, that's all estradiol benefits there. 
estriol. Estriol is a weak estrogen. Once the body converts to estriol, it doesn't convert back. And so sometimes I will replace estriol in estrogen dominant women because it can be extremely helpful when someone has issues with vaginal dryness and lubrication. Because if you have urinary tract infections and lots of yeast infections, oftentimes you're lacking estriol. Estriol being the weak estrogen, I don't mind giving folks suppositories in this case or creams or drops. And I'll talk about that in a second in terms of how we, we provide hormone replacement therapy. But estriol is, is a good estrogen. You just don't want estrone and you don't want to push your estradiol too hard. And so in this case, if you are estrogen dominant, you want to make sure you have your hormones tested before someone just puts you on hormone replacement therapy. Absolutely want to do this. And in particular, for those of you who are estrogen dominant, I usually don't recommend any estrogens. I recommend an estrogen cleanse, and then we work on progesterone boosting, and we go from there in terms of working on balancing your stress levels and getting cortisol in check. Because if we can get cortisol in check, we can eventually bring you off the, the progesterone. So ultimately, my goal is to never have people on hormone replacement therapy permanently ever, really. Okay, so now I kind of jumped a little bit down that route in terms of hormone replacement therapy, and I kind of want to keep on that for a second, and I'll swing back to what the heck to do about estrogen dominance. So there's different forms of hormone replacement therapy. There's creams. There's something called trochies. These are like little packets um, that you suck on, and, and they're kind of like candies of sorts. There's pills. There's also liquid drops. And then we also have inserted pellets that can be inserted under the skin. Most of these forms are going to be coming from a compounded pharmacy or a specialty pharmacy in the case of the pellets. Now, I am a huge proponent of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy if I see it useful in an individual. And the reason being is because those hormones look like our hormones naturally floating around in our body. So our body assimilates them better and uses them better. Whereas synthetic hormones that we're using coming from, say, horse urine, you probably heard of Premarin or something in that case, um, these guys are synthetic. They do not look like our natural hormones, and so you got to use higher dosages to get effect. And then you don't really know what these synthetic hormones are doing when they're kind of floating around in the body trying to figure out what to do with them. So I personally like to use bioidenticals, yes, you can only get them through a compounding pharmacy. Your insurances usually will not cover them, but I think it's well worth its weight in gold. For example, in the case of my females that I'm working with that I give progesterone creams to, I give low-dose creams, anywhere between 10 to 30 milligrams, sometimes 50 milligrams of the micronized progesterone. And what they do is they rub that micronized progesterone into their upper thighs, into their upper arms, into their wrists, into thin tissue. Most of the time I prefer their upper arms or the thighs because they're not going to be coming into contact with their kids or family members because we don't want a bunch of kids with with transdermal, so meaning this progesterone gets across onto their skin and then they start to absorb it. And that does happen. And so that is why it's absolutely critical if you're using hormone replacement therapy to put these creams in locations that someone's not going to get as much access to. Now, creams are only one option. Creams are the most bioavailable. I have seen the best results with creams. However, you could get pills, you could have drops, etc. So I often will give small amounts of progesterone to ladies to help to counter the effect of the body stealing the precursors to make progesterone and making cortisol instead. So if I've got a lady who's really stressed out, her life's chaotic, maybe she has three kids and she's getting these migraines right before her period where she can't really do anything and, and pretty much does have to lock herself in a room that's dark and quiet, that doesn't work so well for life. And so I will do that in these cases. And I combine it with estrogen cleansing. And by that I mean you can use cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. These guys, these, this brassica family of veggies has something in it called diindylmethane. It is a type of molecule, which methane, yeah, stinky, it's what gives us a little bit of the gas, but this molecule helps to rid the body of estrone and inflammatory, the inflammatory estrogen, and so it kind of peels it out of the body and helps to leach it out. 
The other thing that does this is something called calcium d glucurate and I use the combination of these two along with herbs to clear the liver because our liver is where we make our hormones and oftentimes if the liver's bogged down because of toxins in the environment or we're eating crappy or we're exposed to a lot of chemicals, that liver gets bogged down and it can't process the hormones like it should. And so oftentimes I really like to combine a liver cleansing agent with methane and calcium deglucurate. And I use a product called Dim Detox. It is by a company called Pure Encapsulations. If you listen to my previous podcast on endocrine disruptors, you would know about it. It's in there. But I have that resource provided in my resources section on my website. And you can click on that link at the end of my show notes if you want to find out more information on Pure Encapsulations Dim Detox. By the way, I don't get any money from this company um, whatsoever. I just really like the product and I know it works. And oftentimes, if I'm working on clearing extra estrogens, that's one of the ways I'm using, um, one of the products I'm using, and then increasing progesterone foods and hormones um, in the body. Now, another way that you could approach this that I do quite often as well is I don't even use progesterone. I use foods that boost progesterone. And the foods in that list are tahini, so ground sesame seeds or sesame seeds. The reason tahini is better is because all too often the sesame seeds go in one way and they come out the same way. We don't digest them well. So you want to blend it up. So I prefer tahini. And typically I'll have ladies doing two tablespoons of tahini from mid-cycle to the start of their period because that's when progesterone should be higher. Same thing goes with sunflower seeds. I'll have ladies grind them up and do two tablespoons of those. Now, this method with the sunflower seeds and the sesame seeds isn't anything new. It is actually something called seed cycling. And there is a way to seed cycle so that you can balance your estrogen and your progesterone. Now, that being said, one of the common phenomenons here is that we have a lot of ladies who are into chia seeds and flax seeds. And you're taking flax oil or flax seeds or you're doing, you know, breads with it or crackers with it or anything because of the fiber amount. But guess what? Chia and flax promote estrogen. So does pumpkin, so do pumpkin seeds. So if you're eating these on a daily basis throughout your whole cycle, you're messing with your hormones. I highly recommend anybody who's estrogen dominant to actually not do the chia and flax too much. You can do them here and there, but honestly, if it's an everyday thing, obviously cut it out. If you want to help with regulation of hormones, I usually do recommend from first day of the period to day 14 or 15, just kind of getting the body to kind of cycle on a natural level. So it's first half of the cycle, use the chia and the flax. The other side of this is that we've got this phase of a lot of folks using soy and and soy organically and soy conventionally, it doesn't matter. Soy beans whether they're soybean oil, whether it's soybean, so miso, whether it is just straight soybean, seitan, any of the vegan types of products for protein, soy promotes estrogen in the body. If you are already estrogen dominant, it's going to mess with you. It's a problem. And I have a lot of folks having issues there. Another big thing is beer. Beer promotes estrogen. Hops in particular are a plant estrogen. They promote estrogen production. I give hops to my ladies who just had a baby so that they can promote milk letdown. You don't want too much hops. Look at a guy who's had a lot of beer. What happens? Beer belly and man boobs. Hello, promotion of estrogen. So ladies, if you like the beer, great. Maybe consider keeping it to the first half of your cycle and really honestly limit it, really limit it one to two times a week at the most, but watching it. I mean, honestly, in in a perfect world, if we're trying to balance your estrogen dominance, I ditch the alcohol altogether. It's just better that way. And and believe me, I am not a, I, I like my wine. I like my, I like having some beer here and there, but honest to goodness, it, it helps to just not do it. Same thing goes with any of the malt liquors and things of that nature. Um, just keep it in mind. So there's that being said. Now, what I typically do to, to fully assess a patient in this case is I was mentioning, you want to know where your hormone levels are first before you venture into any of this 
replacement or knowing what to do in terms of balancing things. And ideally, you want a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor to help you with this because that's where we shine, that's where we specialize. And in this case, you're wanting to look at either blood or saliva. And the difference between taking um, a sample of blood or saliva is that blood is going to show bound hormones. Saliva is going to show unbound hormones. I like saliva hormone testing better because it gives us a really good sense of what hormones are out there floating around. What can we use? What's available? Whereas blood shows us what's bound. It just shows us one kind of part of the picture. Um, and, And I like to see the whole picture, what's hanging out. And in particular for estrone, what is hanging out? Because blood, we don't get a good assay of estrone. And estrone being the inflammatory estrogen, I like to look at this via saliva. Now, we also have urine tests out on the market now, dried urine, to determine hormone levels as well. I haven't used them as much. They're just kind of coming into popularity. I'm going to play with them a little bit and assess. Some folks say that they're better, but I, at this point, haven't determined. And and unfortunately, what I like to do, or fortunately, what I like to do is I like to keep my patients consistent. If I tested them with blood, I'm going to retest them after one month of hormone replacement using blood. If I'm testing them with saliva to start off, I'm going to keep saliva because it's the same, you know, comparing apples to apples. So you can get a hold of saliva testing easily online, by yourself, a company called ZRT Labs. You can also go to a functional medicine or a naturopathic doctor who specializes in hormone replacement therapy and hormone balancing and and get testing. And I highly recommend looking into it. I use a company called Labrix for my saliva testing. I also use ZRT Labs for my saliva testing. In terms of blood, I'm just using LabCorp, regular old boring LabCorp. Um, Sorry, LabCorp people. I don't really mean that you're boring. It's just a regular old lab. And so I use those two. And in terms of testing, I look at day 16 to 29 of the period. I want to see the second half of the cycle. And the reason I say 29 is because not everyone has a 28 day cycle. That's like perfect world. That doesn't happen as often as I would like it to. Um, so day 16 to 29, so you have to be past ovulation. Say you don't ovulate, say you don't know where you're ovulating, that's okay. If you're at least tracking where your period is coming, you can determine, okay, I am a couple days before my period, do a saliva or blood test at that point. Say you don't get your period regularly, that's okay. Test at any time, it doesn't matter because we have no idea where you're at. And, and in that case, it gives me a good sense because estrone is pretty consistent and, and I can tell if progesterone levels are, are kind of even midway normal and your estrone is off the charts, that's estrogen dominance. It's easy enough. Now, I highly recommend when you test your hormones via saliva that you also look at cortisol levels because cortisol is crucial to messing with your hormones. Like I said before, our bodies take the precursors to making progesterone, steal it from that pathway and make cortisol instead. And so just knowing if your cortisol is off the charts, if it's really high, I know right there that your progesterone is going to be low and we need to balance that out. So those of you who have access to ZRT labs or a functional medicine doctor that can get you some lab testing via saliva, by all means do it. It's it's better way to go. Via blood with cortisol, you have to go in in the morning between six and eight in the morning and you get one test. So we only know what's happening in the morning. With blood, we are not doing afternoon samples because when I do hormone samples for ladies, we do four tests. We do a morning, we do a before lunch, a before dinner, and a before bed sample. And that gives us a really good range of what's happening throughout the day. Whereas with blood, it's one and done. And so it's one snapshot sample. So that's another reason why I use saliva because I get more data and I'm a big data person. So those things being said, one of the other components of hormone replacement is to keep in mind, if you are a female, that's postmenopausal. So say you're noticing that you have weight gain still in your thighs and upper back, and so you're estrogen dominant, but you haven't had your period in more than 10 years, you do not want to be messing around with hormone replacement therapy 
um, because there's more risk in that case and, and not a benefit for the bones or the heart or anything. And cancer, fibroids, and starting a period again can be a big issue here. I unfortunately, in my first couple of years of practicing, I started a period on a lady who hadn't had a period in seven years and she wasn't too happy with me. And I don't blame her. Um, it's, it's not a good thing. So keep that in mind if you know anyone that's been at, had menopause for more than 10 years or been in menopause for more than 10 years. Hormone replacement therapy is not an option, but cleansing the body of estrogens and working on naturally boosting progesterone totally is. And one of the best folks out there is a gal who runs the website Hormones Balance. Her name's Magdalena um, Wislacki, I believe is how you say her last name. And I will also have that on my show notes so that you can go to her link to check out information there. So what are the other benefits of helping with balancing your hormones? Well, you're also going to work with decreasing heart attack risk. Your bone density is going to improve, your skin, your gut. You can have less hives and itching. You're definitely, if we work on estriol, we can work on those urinary tract infection and vaginal issues too that'll interfere with sex life. And so there are definite benefits to hormone replacement therapy. I don't want to scare you, but just that being said, estrogen dominance in and of itself needs to be evaluated first before you go on replacing a whole bunch of hormones in the body. And if I can't get anything else across today, it's get your hormones tested before you start messing with hormone replacement. Even if it's seeds and nuts and herbs, just get your hormones tested. So one of the other big things that I wanted to talk about is exactly what you can do to boost progesterone naturally. And I had mentioned briefly tahini, and I had mentioned briefly sunflower seeds. Evening primrose oil is at 1,000 milligrams a day is amazing for helping to boost progesterone levels naturally, as is Vitex, which is known as chasteberry. I oftentimes will use the two of those together from mid-cycle to the start of the period. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know when I ovulate. Okay, that's great. There's two ways to go about it. You could get an ovulation predictor kit, they're not that expensive, and you could work on testing your urine from about day 8 to 10 or so of your cycle all the way through until you get a positive on your ovulation prediction kit. The other way you can do it is you could literally take a thermometer, put it next to your bed, and before even getting up in the morning, you just take your temperature and log your temperature. When you notice a half a temperature to a full degree of temperature rise, that's when you're ovulating. Now, this is tricky because if we're stressed out, that's that those numbers of up and down with temperature wise can look like a razor blade or not a razor blade, a saw blade up and down, up and down. And so that's, that makes it really tricky for ladies. So I highly recommend considering an ovulation predictor kit or talking with a functional medicine doctor or naturopath to figure out how to calculate these things properly. So going back to stress hormones, I talked about testing cortisol. I also really highly like to look at neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters, meaning serotonin, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. These are all your neurotransmitters in your brain. I especially like to look at these if we've got mood stuff, especially if we're really irritable, angry, our or we become extremely depressed, or we're having just really violent mood swings because sometimes the cortisol levels can interfere with neurotransmitters. And so I like to see this because it gives me a comprehensive idea of the entire picture. You can do neurotransmitter testings using urine, and the company I use is Labrix. They're out of Clackamas, Oregon, labrix.com. I'll put that in the end of the resources. Check them out. I highly recommend looking at your neurotransmitters too, especially if you're having violent mood swings and and your family's joking to lock you away for the week before your period. And it it gives some, sheds some light into what's going on. I also highly recommend it if you have a history of depression related to the period or crying spells or or you're just chronically depressed and, and have been for life and you're chronically fatigued, I think it's absolutely important to look at those neurotransmitters too because they can have a huge impact and, and knowing the whole picture because just looking at hormones in this case is sometimes just going to give you half the picture. 
neurotransmitters can be extremely enlightening to know what the heck is going on. So we've covered estrogen dominance. We've covered a little bit on, on hormone replacement therapy. The big takeaway that I want you to have from this segment is that if you are struggling every single month with irritability and or depression, crying spells, mood swings, breast tenderness, insomnia, any of these issues, it's highly important to get your hormones tested to figure out if you're estrogen dominant because a lot of the population is and we just keep going through life thinking that PMS is normal and it's no big deal. We just deal with it every single month. And honestly, waiting too long can have some serious implications. I'll give you a little story. My mom died in 2004 of estrogen positive breast cancer. She had PMS pretty much her entire life from when she started her period at 12 years of age. She ignored it. She thought, eh, it's life no big deal. My mom being a very healthy individual and let's say maybe a borderline hippie was really into soy. And back in the 70s and 80s when we started to really just come out with figuring out, oh, soy is good for us. It's beneficial. My mom went nuts on it and she ate a ton of soy and miso and things of that nature. And she did a lot of cooking in Teflon pans because that was all the rage, the nonstick pans and microwave, the microwave, oh my goodness, was a big deal. And guess what happened? She was microwaving plastic. She was cooking in Teflon pans that were scratched. And my mom, love her, had a very bad habit of loving Diet Coke. And I'm sure a lot of people out there can really sympathize with this because it's, you know, it's either Diet Coke or Pepsi in this case, or Coke Zero. And those guys have bisphenol A on the lining. This is a hormone disruptor. Totally can mess with your amount of estrogen you have in your body. Combine that for my mom of living on a farm where this was back in the day where the DDT trucks would come down the street and they literally would run behind the DDT trucks. So she had all of these different factors combined. And she was tested for the genetics to have breast cancer and she did not have any of the genetics. She was just estrogen positive. My aunt also died of breast cancer, my mom's sister. Same thing, estrogen positive. My aunt lived a little bit different life than my mom, but they were both very similar in their love for what it would be called the, you know, hippie food back in those days. They both loved their soy and they both loved um experimenting with the different vegetarian foods and the microwave and plastic microwaving day in day out i mean tupperware both of them were tupperware wraps so you get the idea here plastic tupperware heating it up putting leftovers in it day in day out and then microwaving it so both of them did that for years they both had pms and did nothing about it my mom's thighs were kind of larger she definitely had the the bra fluff and unfortunately she did nothing about it found a lump in her breast in in 1995 the doctor said it was no big deal unfortunately she waited a year before she had it checked again and by then it was stage four cancer now of course that's extreme but the point being here is that she had long-standing pms my dad even tells me to this day that he wanted to lock her away the week before her period and she would talk about her headaches before it and and never did anything whatsoever and so as I see myself growing up and getting older, um, I haven't grown up yet fully. That's not happening. But I, I also gain weight in my thighs and gain weight above my, my bra. I have the bra fluff. And I went through a really stressful period in the last year and started to notice that my PMS types of symptoms were coming back. And I was starting to gain weight in those exact areas. And when I looked back at my hormones, guess what? I was progesterone deficient like no other. I had insomnia. I had all the classic cases. And so to correct that, I did do an estrogen detox, just like I'm telling you, the dim detox. Um, I also added zinc because I was one of those people who was doing a low-carb paleo diet and was loving my almond flour brownies and loving using nut flour for everything. And come to find out, I also did have my copper tested in my red blood cells, and it was off the charts. So... 
those are big deals. I did not have an IUD. That's another thing, ladies, if you have IUDs, there's a copper IUD. Guess what? Lots of copper right to the uterus. Not a great thing. So you want to have zinc to offset that. I took and I still take zinc 15 milligrams a day to offset copper. The other big thing to keep in mind too is these copper pans are on the, the TV shows and commercials right now. You could put cheese on it and it slides right off. Guess what? You get a bunch of copper in that. Combine that with eating copper, um, heavy nuts and seeds, and now you create yourself an even more estrogen-dominant world. So even in myself at this point, I have done the estrogen cleansing. So if you have a mom or relatives that had estrogen-positive cancer, you want to get your hormones tested. You want to know where you are, and you want to start getting things in check because this is cancer prevention right here. Because unfortunately, if you're not cancer genetically inclined, and I'm not, I've been tested. I don't have any genes to develop breast cancer whatsoever. It's all on me. And in your case, if you're suffering with this type of issue of estrogen dominance, it's absolutely key to take care of it now. You do not have to think about hormone replacement therapy um, in the sense of you're not in menopause. Ladies, if you have stress, if you are noticing weight gain on the thighs, you've got bra fluff, hanging over, so tissues hanging over that bra, you're struggling with PMS, you're struggling with mood swings, absolutely go get tested for your hormones, whether it's saliva, whether it's blood, whatever's easiest, just get something to get a read on how much progesterone you have in your body. Because if you don't have enough, chances are that estrogen will go wild and could cause cancer. And so because I don't want to end this on a, a sad note, I just definitely want you to know that there's hope out for you, there for you and you can definitely change things around. Get in touch with a great naturopath or functional medicine doc in your area who knows what's up in terms of dealing with hormones and get yourself back in alignment and get that extra estrogen out of your body. So for my protocols that I've used, I've got a resource for you. Go over and click on it. It's in my website. It is drjkrausnd.com and go to my resources tab. You can grab it all there for free. And I'd love to hear from you in terms of how things go. If you have questions, by all means, post underneath this um, podcast and, and let me know how you're doing out there and what you're thinking and if you have any questions. Once again, this has been another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Thank you for listening. Thanks for tuning in to The Health Fix, the podcast all about taking control of your health, rebelling against aging, and having fun every day. A lot of patients ask me, do you think I'm aging too fast? So, I created an evaluation checklist for you to see for yourself. Plus, I created a resource guide to help you slow down the aging process right now. You can find it for free on my website, drjkrausnd.com. If you like this podcast, help get the word out to others by liking it and rating it. If you'd like more natural health tips and want to join our Facebook community where I interact daily, click on the Join Group button on our website at drjkrausnd.com.